Okay. In this video, I want to think about images in a slightly different way. Let's first, though, think about how we've been thinking about them so far. <laughs> how have we been doing that? We have an image. You know, our example is a file called frog.jpg. Can you see that? I think so. It's got a frog in it. And we load that image, and maybe we have a processing window, and the frog, oh my god, I'm going to try to draw a frog, um, is drawn into the window. So we take this image that we've loaded from a file and we're drawing it into the window. Another thing that we've seen is, well, instead of just taking the image and displaying it all by once, what if we look at every single pixel one at a time? Let's look at this first pixel and let's do something to it and set that first pixel there. Let's look at that second pixel, let's do something to it, and let's set that second pixel there. Image processing, make it brighter, make it darker, th threshold effect, blah, 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 all this stuff that we've been doing. Here's a different way that I want to think about what we might do with an image in this video. <laughs> okay, here is a processing window. What if I forgot all about the fact that I could load images or do anything with images and all I'm doing is I'm making some kind of drawing pattern. Oh, maybe I wrote a program that draws cool squiggly lines all over the screen. Or maybe I wrote a program that's a particle system and uh, there's all these bubbles and when I click the mouse the bubbles float up and they bounce across the top and then they explode into flying stars and hearts, whatever it is. Whatever kind of animated geometric design algorithmic pattern thingy mabobber that you're making, you're making it. How do you decide what colors should be in this thing? Maybe you pick your favorite colors. My favorite colors are purple and pink. Maybe you pick your uh, random colors and you use random or maybe Perlin noise or Gaussian or all these crazy other ways of picking numbers. But maybe you have something else. Maybe you have a database of color. You have this like file with all these things written in it, which are all the colors that you'd like, a palette, so to speak. What could be that database of color? What could be that palette? It could be a source image. So what if instead of simply drawing an image or having a one-to-one -one every pixel pixel, every pixel pixel, I just had an independent drawing system from which I am pulling colors from an image? How would we make that work? So this is what I want to start to do, and I'm, I, I want to I'll build a couple little quick examples um, to see how this might work. So let's go back over, to, I hope I'm recording, <laughs> I am recording. Let's go back over here over to the code. Uh, oops, you can see my laptop. All secrets are revealed. Okay, hopefully that's better. Um, by the way, I have this, watch this. Whoa, can you hear that? This like hydraulic desk, okay. Uh, all right, so you know, we've gotta take some minutes here to enjoy the, the small, wonderful little things in life. Okay, so here's a processing sketch. Uh, it loads an image, it draws the image, and that's what it does. Now, let's think about some other things we might do in a processing sketch. Like, let's say I make a black background at the beginning, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw a circle uh, somewhere in the window instead. Here's my independent drawing system. How should I pick my colors? Maybe I'll pick my colors from the frog. But let's make this a little bit more interesting. Let's, at least every time we run through draw, let's draw a circle at a different location. So now if we run this, we can see every time through draw, I'm not erasing the background, I'm drawing a new circle, I'm drawing a new circle, I'm drawing a new circle. And we could say, we could, we could, we could take ourselves up on this challenge and say, what are my favorite colors? My favorite colors are, uh, you know, some sort of purplish color. Now I'm drawing it purplish. I could say, actually, what I wanted is it to be a random color. Now I'm drawing them somewhat randomly. Now let's do something finally different. What if I were to say, give me a color from the frog? Look at this little bit of code here. The get function. Now, here's a moment. I don't remember what I did in the previous videos. I wish I did. But in the previous video, certainly we were accessing the pixel array. We were saying, um, we were saying, we would say something like this, frog.pixels and then the pixels index. And maybe that index would be an x plus y times the width, right? This, we spent, we certainly spent all this time trying to make, figure out how this algorithm works, right? There's a two-dimensional image 
all the pixels in that image are in a one-dimensional array. If I have an x and y coordinate, I want to look up in a pixel from that. I need to convert from the x and the y to that single index into the array. And this is probably how we should do this example here. But just for simplicity, uh, and this is sort of the, the, fastest, the, the fastest way of doing these pixel operations. But if you'll notice something about this example that I'm making, how many pixels do I need to look up in draw here? One. Every time through draw, I just want a single pixel. Where am I drawing this ellipse? That single pixel here, um, we can use the get function. Get is convenient. It's maybe a little slower, but in this case, it's totally fine. We just need one pixel. But if I run this, I'm going to get an error. The method get expects parameters like this, int int. Oh, this is a lovely error message, by the way. This is, if, if you're don't, not aware, I mean, this, this is going to become qu quickly out of date, this video, then, if I say this. But this is version 3.0 A5. Uh, a lot of the error messages have changed in recent processing versions to make them a bit more friendly and understandable. But what is the error here? I mean, I'm able to draw an ellipse at pixel x, comma y, even though they're not integers. But while processing is a forgiving and friendly and happy to take your floating point numbers and figure out which pixel you meant on the screen, after all, pixels are really integers. There's no such thing as pixel 2.5 or 3.5. I think, I think we might have covered this at some point. I really shouldn't make these videos like weeks apart because I have no idea what I did in the previous one. But let's think about this. If I have an image and I have a pixel, location like 300 comma 215, these are integers. There's no pixel 215.2. There might be kind of sub-pixels in our mind and fancy ways of thinking about this, but we need an integer. Even if I say ellipse 300.5, where processing is really going to draw that ellipse, it's going to just take off that decimal place and draw it at 300. And however, with the get function, with the pixel array, we have to really enforce that use of integer. So I'm going to very an easy way for me to do this is to simply convert these values into integers before I ask for that pixel color. And I'm going to do this. We can see, oh, if only we could just sit here and wait for a long period of time, maybe we would see our frog. Um, so in my mistakes, I stopped and paused the video and I've returned. I actually let this run for a while, which was a good result, which you can start to see that that image of the frog kind of peering through here. So we've, what we've done is we're not displaying the image anywhere. We're simply loading it into memory. We came up with some weird idea, which was like, let's just draw circles all over the screen. And then we picked colors out of the, we picked colors out of that image. We, essentially, that image became a lookup table, a database of color by which we, um, wherever we drew a circle, we looked up the corresponding color at that in that location in the image and drew it there. So let's just do a couple um, more things to this. One is uh, I'm going to take out the stroke, and then I'm uh, also going to just to make this happen faster. If I put a little loop in draw. I can say like, oh, just do a hundred at a time. So now we can see now we can see that we're just like layering a hundred random circles with colors every frame, and and you can sort of see the quality here is kind of different. It has this um, the resolution is not very high, but you can see all these circles are picking up the colors from the image. And another thing we might do is uh, just add a little alpha here. So if I give it an alpha value of 25, you can see that now these colors are going to slowly blend in over time. And you get this kind of watery-like uh, appearance. And, and, and if uh, you know, I'm kind of addicted to doing this. If I did do 500 circles per frame, it's going to be much, much faster. And you might even see almost as if we have this kind of shimmering version of a frog. So this is one example. Uh, I kind of. Um, Let's, let me save this and let me go to a different sketch. You know, there's, there's not much different about this sketch other than instead of simply randomly placing a circle on the screen each frame, this is, uh, they're particle objects, they move randomly about, and while they're moving, there's no reason why I couldn't say like, okay, well where, here where I display it, I'm making them white, why don't I uh, pull up wherever, e this frog is, uh, this frog, this ellipse is going to be drawn at x comma y. Why don't I, before I draw it, wherever it is, look up the pixel underneath in that image? 
So uh, if I go back and actually, uh, I need to load the image. I already have it in the data folder. I did that before. JPEG. And let's go back to this crucial, right? Let me put this in here, 255. We can see there are my white circles. Now let me instead say, see the color from the frog. And you can see wherever it is, it's sort of revealing the color that's underneath it in that image. Now we can't make out the frog at all. I could say like, okay, well what if I, instead of having 2,000, made 3,000 circles? Um, and you can see like, oh, you can sort of see how that frog is kind of being revealed as these circles move around. I could start to do things like, okay, well let's, uh, let's give it some alpha. And if I do that, you can see like, oh, it's like much dimmer. But what if instead of drawing the background every frame, I move the background back into setup. And you can see, oh, I'm like painting the frog now as these particles move about. And I had so many on the screen, I wonder if this would have been a slightly more effective demonstration with only 100. You can see how these are moving around and we're kind of, they're kind of streaking and painting. So again, I haven't picked two very creative ideas. I just said, okay, well, why don't I randomly put circles on the screen, or why don't I randomly move circles around the screen? But you could come up with a much more elaborate set of behaviors, uh, things bouncing into each other, swirling around in spiral patterns, things that aren't just circles, uh, streaks of lines. Could you make a kind of like, uh, what kind of painterly, non-photorealistic rendering techniques might you be able to generate by layering shapes with different alphas? What, what if you use like images, like other images that you're tinting as they're like smearing across? There's so many possibilities. But I will leave you with uh, a couple exercises. Um, one is, uh, if, as soon as I have some system where you could find these code examples, although they're, they're mostly the same as in the in learning processing chapter, uh, 15. Um, let me give you a couple exercises. One is uh, change these from using get to using the pixel array, just as a kind of practice between get and the pixel array and seeing the difference. Another thing you might think about is this one that, this particle one that we just made, these particles are moving and their, their color is adapting to their location according to the image. But what if you drew the entire image as a set of particles, and then the particles started moving, but they took their pixel color with, a, with them? So could you make an image kind of fall apart, and then could it put itself back together? So that's certainly a challenging problem, but one that you might think of in terms of like practicing all of these techniques. And, and the last one that I'll mention, I think which is worth, uh, which is one of the examples here, is you might think about what this would mean in three dimensions. So if I went, um, open up this example, and I hope this works, and I think it's just using a sunflower, and it's very low. Um, but you can see here, uh, we have this image, which is actually drawn as a bunch of rectangles, and I'm moving those pixels in a three-dimensional space according to their brightness. So this is another thing you might think about. What if you, had, if you took a two-dimensional image and brought it into 3D? Could you, could you have a pick uh, a kind of like three, three dimensional space of pixels that are all moving around each other. Okay, so uh, you will write some comments or email me or tweet at me, I guess. Um, and uh, I will um, uh, provide some solutions to some of these exercises or answer questions or post on the forum. I don't know, there's gotta be some better way of being in touch with each other than me just spouting to a camera with a screen behind me. But uh, for now, I'm going to go this video. I meant to time it. It's, I don't know, it's been a while. <laughs> Goodbye.